Joe. Doing a bit of washing today and uh try to write some music. Just going to do some um, reading from this book. All around ministry, C. H. Spurgeon. I gave it to someone to read. I hadn't even read it myself. I'm not sure who it was written by. Yeah, it could have been someone in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. He might have knew Charles Spurgeon. He might have written a little bit about his own history. Just going to briefly go over it. Uh, this is just from the introduction. There is no doubt that Spurgeon's options on this subject were greatly strengthened. So this is about um, Calvinism. Um, okay, so we'll just, just discuss that. Puts a lot of people off Spurgeon, but there's a lot of good points that Spurgeon did in his ministry. I think his ministry wasn't like the best that, you know, um, that I've ever studied, but he's, he's, he's very interesting nonetheless started very powerfully, very to the point, a straight to the point preacher. Um, people clamoured to hear him speaking, so he's a very good speaker. Um, quite quite well read, he started the ministry very young, so he was coming into a sort of an inherited Baptist theologies and whatnot, and you know, pagan festivals of the Catholic festivals, which we'll talk about. It says, there is no doubt that Spurgeon and Upson the subject are greatly strengthened by his own personal experience. As well, as is well known, he had received no regular college training. Very interesting, even the apostles never received any college training. So, why all these men of God start up and then they open colleges uh, is, is beyond me. I mean, it's, it's meant to be a calling upon your life that you act upon um, on your free will. Uh, so... He puts emphasis on going to college, but again, very strange. The most prominent men of God never went to college. Uh, no regular college training, but from his earliest days in his grandfather's manse at Stanborn, he had been grounded in Calvinistic theology. Not so good if you're an angel, is it? You're grounded, but you know, it's grounded, okay, it's fine. It's uh, earthly, whatever. It just depends what you mix in with what the Apostle Paul actually taught about election and grace and free will. You know, many are called but few are chosen. That's what the Apostle Paul was speaking about. You know, we we as the elect of God, you know, God has selected us to do a job in the beginning for him. Along the way Satan is going to tempt us. Satan is going to, well, there's going to be trials that's going to happen. Um, in our lives, you know, we're not protected like from from Satan when, when we get saved. I, I'd probably say we're more exposed to his devices because he's because we are at the front line now as believers. So again, this is something that's not properly taught. I, I feel as if Calvinistic theology is really um, it's a closed door thing. It's a black and white thing. You know, if you're born again, you can't lose your salvation. The Bible doesn't teach that. Um, you know, pray one prayer about asking Jesus into your life. Um, live your life like uh, the devil, and then what? You're going to see that person saved because he prayed a prayer? Calvinistic theology? No, no, no. When, when he began preaching in London, he proved again what most had forgotten since the days of Whitfield. That in that divinity lies the true power of a gospel ministry. Well, that's just like saying that rain is wet. The sun is hot, you know, um, and so on. Uh, so obviously you've got to have God in your life to have um, the Lord moving within your ministry. And there are fruits um, that, that testify about that. And it's not necessarily numbers. You know, people look at numbers all the time, which is interesting. But, you know, no, I never had a single convert. And uh, he was the, the, the one chosen by God to, you know, basically warn the earth about coming judgment, evangelize, if you like, in a very similar fashion 
the God of heaven and earth is going to judge the earth. We are preaching the same thing. We know that in the last days that there will be a judgment of fire upon the earth and not water as before. But a lot of devastation. I think Jeremiah 25, I think it is, which speaks about the coastal event. And the rev it ties it in with Revelation 8.8. 8. So, like, these men of God, you know, this is for now. I mean, God has revealed that to me now through pastors. You know, my, my journey all the way, God confirming his word. And so, there's, there's not that many that, un you know, understand God's word for now. This was written over a hundred years ago. Probably made a lot better sense then. But the Bible, written 2,000 years ago and, and more, and still makes sense today, you know. So we find an interesting sidelight on this fact in an article in the Times of April 13th, 1857. The article dealt with a connection between strong doctrine, again, strong doctrine isn't in the Bible, there's truth and there's error. The popular teaching, popular teaching could be anything, like hell is, is a popular teaching, hell exists. Now, now the Pope says it doesn't, so is hell going out of fashion? You know, how about... The, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, that's very much uh, the first century church were, were very much into that. Look at the Corinthians, you know, they say that the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit were only for the apostles. No, the Corinthians very much had the gifts of the Holy Spirit. A lot of other assemblies very much had the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, Agabus was a prophet as well. He wasn't one of the apostles, but he was from another um, assembly, you know. Uh, so it, pr it proves that theology wrong, you know, that the, the the Holy Spirit gifts were for uh, the apostles. Wrong. Why did why did the apostle Paul write so much about it in Corinthians? It's so that we can read it and we can gain understanding of what the gift of tongues is for, when it should be spoken, if it should be spoken out in a, in a, in a, in a public assembly without an interpreter. That type of thing. There's heavenly tongues and there's earthly tongues. So obviously, if if God gives you an insight into you start speaking in Chinese and there's Chinese people around or um, you, you, the Holy Spirit just comes on you and you're praying in a heavenly language. I've seen people singing praises to God in a heavenly language which is uh, the, 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 the presence of God that comes out of that is just, you know, if you've never experienced that, please pray. Everything you read in the Bible, pray about it. That's why I've got such a, a good experience with the Lord and the Holy Spirit. You know, if I've read about it in the Bible, ask God about it, and the Lord leads me accordingly. You know, what about the Sabbath? What about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? What about grace? What about election? What about this? And the Lord will show me. Um, so just keep going through this page in the introduction here. Popular teaching, pointing to Spurgeon's extraordinary success as a proof. That means, but he certainly started off. He inherited um, a lot of Catholic theology, and he ended up shunning a lot of the theology towards the end of his ministry. So I'm not sure how many of a congregation he had towards the end, as opposed to he had in the beginning. I bet it was a lot less than he started with. Just like Jesus, you know. I mean, the apostles left him after he said certain things. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Can you imagine a preacher saying that today in a pulpit? Brethren, I received the word this morning for you. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, watch your backside on the way out. You know, everybody just be leaving if, if, if a preacher said that today. But Jesus said that. Eloquence that will move the masses, the writer said, requires not merely a loud voice, but proper material to exert itself upon. What about the Bible? <laughs> yes. Anybody that's not had a proper set of sunglasses, maybe that's another reason. I like the yellow ones. You know, I'm thinking about joining the yellow sunglasses gang. Maybe. Or they can join my gang. Get a set of those. Nobody shouts out an axiom in mathematics. Nobody balances probabilities in thunder. Have you ever heard a gypsy, um, gypsy's horse coming in at 63 to 1? Probabilities in thunder. You might, you might as well. You might as well camp out under a tree during a thunderstorm. 
Gypsy Swaps comes in at 63 to 1. You're not going to sleep for about three days. You know, how about um, a, a Catholic priest's uh, numbers coming up in the lottery? You know, after the 50th time, he's, he's reading them out. 6, 15, 27, 35, 46 in the Thunderball, 48. <laughs> Just be like reading it for days. Mathematics with enthusiasm. Again, this was written 100 years ago. So, <laughs> I'm taking the mickey a little bit. There must be a strong sentiment, some bold truth to make a man shout. The doctrine of sudden conversion or of irresistible grace can be shouted. And again, I just feel as if, <coughs> I feel as if another thing that a lot of sinners say is that God, God will understand. You know, if I do this, or if I worship God this way, or if I eat an Easter egg, or if I uh, wear this dress, whatever, God will understand. Is, is that scriptural? God will understand. What is scriptural is, you, me, were meant to pray for the spirit of understanding. Of course God understands everything. God, God understands the end from the beginning, the middle from the end, everything in between. But we are meant to ask for the spirit of understanding. And that's one of the dimensions of the Holy Spirit found in Isaiah 11, you know. Um, chapter, chapter 11 verse 1 and also is found in the Revelation chapter 4 I think it's verse 5 that talks about the, the seven lampstands not the seven lampstands, these are the angels but the seven spirits of God before God's throne that's what that is, it's like one of them is the spirit of understanding like uh, who had the spirit of understanding would you say possibly Daniel possibly Daniel is, is one example. Spirit of wisdom, probably Solomon's a, an example of the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of strength, you know, be Samson. You know, he could rip wild animals with, with his bare hands to shreds, you know. Very, very powerful indeed. The spirit of might, that was. Um, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, possibly Joseph had that. You know, you see all the temptations and trials that you came up against. Women practically getting naked in front of them. <coughs> and um, you're just going, not for me, thank you. And then getting accused of rape. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. The spirit of the fear of the Lord. Doesn't want to sin against God, even though people are accusing him of sin. Putting him in jail. Attacking his ministry. Yeah. Think about that. Irresistible grace, but if a man um, tried ever so hard to shout in deliverance, delivering a moderate and sensible discourse of free will, he would find himself take, talking quietly despite himself. Free will. Have you ever heard of uh, William Wallace's um, speech to, to the Scots in, in Braveheart? Free will. Freedom. Freedom! Free will. Don't want to be a slave. You know, you, you, can, you can shout that out. I mean, how starved has the body of Christ been? I mean, they're trying to make Charles Spurgeon out as some sort of rock star of Christianity. He's just like, he's got a reasonable ministry, yeah. Tick a lot of boxes and stuff, but he's... How starved are Christians today? You know, trying to make this man like Elvis or something. The Elvis of Christianity, Charles Spurgeon. I mean, come on. Um... A loud voice then must have loud doctrine to develop it. What about right doctrine? But the Church of England has rather a dis distaste for loud doctrine, a general standard opposed to it. Well, if you're saying that, you know, once saved, always saved, Calvinism, man, that's not good doctrine, man. That's bad doctrine, that's error. And I think, to be honest, that towards the end of his ministry, he, he eased off from that Charles Spurgeon. He dropped the pagan festivals, he dropped Christmas, he dropped Easter, Mother's Day, all these pagan festivals, he dropped them all, okay, it's a true fact about them, so, again, you know, to to be popular, I think you got to take some sort of messed up doctrine like Calvinism, and they try and promote that through certain well-known preachers, when the preachers themselves clearly eased off of it towards um, the latter part of their ministries, um, there's one example of, of many. 
mixing opposite truths is what the church does today, qualifying what she teaches with judicious protests and disclaimers. Not much of that going on today. It's just one minute they're believing in hell, one minute they're saying there's no hell, one minute they're believing in heterosexual marriage, one minute they're believing in homosexual marriage is okay, Jesus is gay, Jesus is the the, the church is dead in its sin. The church has no idea about what salvation is and the true Messiah and the true Son of God. You know, they got false gospels, they get false messiahs that they venerate, false men of God that they venerate, that they follow, that the world promotes, you know. That's why I only got a few hits in my videos, you know. But I should tell you that I'm, I'm preaching a lot of truth. She preaches Catholic, Catholicity, if it is really there, Catholicity, with a protest against Rome. It's true, that's what the church does, Church of England or whatever, they still do that. Church of Scotland. Um, Protestantism with a protest against Geneva, not really sure. Geneva's in Switzerland, remember. Sean Ross, we'll talk more about that, maybe if we find them. This is sensible. Well, it may seem sensible and balanced, but it's not. It's double-minded, actually. Um, Roman Geneva, I've got a lot to answer for. Let's just say that. I don't, I don't follow any of them. No. I follow the Word of God. Okay, so who cares about if it's popular? And so we just we just leave it to that. Um, and a little appraisal of Char Charles Spurgeon's uh, book called An All-Round Ministry. Something to learn from, something to bounce off. Sometimes you got to just read these things to get more understanding. A little riff guitar riff today we got. There we go. I think I'll post a few lyrics later on for that song. May the Lord bless you and keep you his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you his shalom.